afternoon. Thank you for attending this month's Ocean Grand Rounds. I am your host, William Pinnock, and today I could not be more excited to welcome three returning presenters to Ocean Grand Rounds, Dr. Erica Cottrell and Dr. Anna Templeton of Ocean and Dr. Blair Darney of Oregon Health and Science University as they present on women's health and reproductive care in community health center settings after Affordable Care Act implementation. Dr. Eric Cottrell holds a joint appointment as a senior investigator at OCHIN and an associate professor at OHSU. Dr. Cottrell has a robust research portfolio focused on health equity, health policy, social and structural determinants of health, reproductive health, and patient health experiences. Dr. Cottrell was principal investigator on the Every Woman study and has led other OCHIN studies focused on the impact of state and federal policy changes in CHC settings, developing and testing EHR tools for identifying and addressing patient reported social determinants of health, the feasibility of using social determinants of health data to inform decisions about healthcare performance and payment, and understanding people's experiences of opioid use disorder and treatment. She has been published in such places as Implementation Science, Annals of Family Medicine, Health Affairs, and Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. Dr. Anna Templeton is a research scientist and network engagement lead at OCHIN and has been published in, to name a few, Health Affairs, Journal of the American Medical Association, OPEN, and Implementation Science. She holds a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree from the University of Washington in Community Health Systems Nursing and has a background in family practice nursing at a federally qualified health center in rural Vermont. Dr. Templeton has worked in primary care, academic, governmental, and nonprofit settings, facilitating practice-based research network development, engagement infrastructure, and mixed methods preventative care studies focused on policy and practice interventions to support equitable, evidence-based primary care delivery and access. And Dr. Blair Darney is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Oregon Health and Science University and health systems and policy at the Oregon Health and Science University slash Portland State University Joint School of Public Health. Dr. Darney is a global reproductive health services researcher and her work assesses service delivery, disparities in utilization of care and health outcomes in the US and Mexico. Her work also focuses on obstetric outcomes, maternal mortality, contraception, and responding to advocacy needs for evidence. She serves as a co-investigator on Every Woman and other studies investigating the effects of Medicaid and other policy changes on contraceptive provision. And you can find Dr. Darney's work published in such places as American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Contraception, and Health Affairs. This session is being recorded. Attendees are muted upon entry, so please, Pose your questions to the Q&A or chat box. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer any questions you may have. We will now pass the mic to Drs. Cottrell, Templeton, and Darney for Every Woman, Reproductive Care in Community Health Center Settings, Women's Health After Affordable Care Act Implementation. Drs. Cottrell, Templeton, and Darney, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, William, for that amazing introduction. It's always so fun to hear you do those. Um, and thanks everyone for joining today. I think this is the first time I've done Grand Rounds where I can't actually see folks and it's a, it's a different experience, but I know you're out there. I was looking at all the names of the folks who are here and really excited to talk with you today about this study. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, just to, before we start, just to, just our you know usual disclosure statement that um, the authors, none of the authors have financial conflicts or disclosures, um, any conflicts of interest to disclose. We also want to acknowledge the funding agency for this research grant. This was an R01 research award from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, we were awarded funding in 2017 and it just wrapped up this, this last fall in 2022. And then also just to acknowledge that this work was conducted uh, with the advance, accelerating data value across a national community health center network, clinical research network. And advance, as many of you have heard about before, is one of, is a, as a, a, a clinical research network as part of PCORNET, which is the National Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Network. And advance is led by OCHIN, but in partnership with Health Choice Network, Fenway Health, and OHSU. And as you'll see when I introduce our team, which I think is on the next slide, we had participants on this study from um, throughout advance. So before we even get to starting to present you with any of these findings, I just wanted to make, make sure to highlight this amazing study team that worked together so collaboratively over the last five years. Um, we have a cadre of, of researchers from OCHIN, um, um, Anna, 
Templeton and myself here are today to represent them, but there were other folks such as G. Oakley, Megan Hoops, Teresa Schmidt, Fran Beal, and jo jo Joanna Georgescu, who also contributed enormously to this, to this study. Um, amazing team of co-investigators at OHSU, Blair Darney is here today to present with us, but also wanted to acknowledge Bridget Hatch, Maria Rodriguez, and Miguel Marino. And, and we also had collaborators from um, Health Choice Network and Fenway, who you can see here, Catherine Chung Bridges, Jenny Potter, and Matteo Peretti. So this was a team effort all the way um, and just wanted to acknowledge this, this incredible team. And I think we can go to the next slide. So some background on this grant um, and sort of the impetus for doing this grant. As many of you know, I think led by, led by Jen DeVoe and her team at OHSU, there had been a, a flurry of grants looking at the impact of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion in safety net populations, in our OCHIN populations. And, and, and we had noticed that there, you know, we saw an opportunity to do something similar, but really to look at the, the provision and utilization of reproductive care in OCHIN settings. This is an area of research that had been relatively unexplored using our OCHIN data. Um, Dr. Darney, who is here, had done some exploratory work in this area, looking at contraceptive utilization, but there hadn't yet been a large scale study really looking at reproductive care and the spectrum of reproductive care in CHC settings. So we set out to do this, um, you know, as all of you know, CHCs are a critical point of access for people who are publicly insured, uninsured or uninsured. And interestingly, if you think about it, nearly a quarter of people who get care in CHCs are women of reproductive age or people um, of reproductive age. Um, the Affordable Care Act, also they really prioritize reproductive care as an essential component of healthcare. So we wanted to really think about, you know, how, how what, what are we seeing on the ground with this and how are we seeing the effects of this rolling out? And specifically Medicaid expansion um, under the Affordable Care Act, it, it gives us a really unique opportunity to look at, there were some states that did expand Medicaid and, and others that chose not to. And it gives us a really unique opportunity to sort of look at comparisons of some of these key outcomes in states that did did expand um, Medicaid and those who did it. Um, this, this, we also recognize that there are other national state and health policies that are um, aimed to increase access to preventive, contraceptive, prenatal and postpartum care. So we looked at some of those and we'll talk about those here and, um, and, and other factors that work at different levels that we also explored in this, in this study. So if you go to the next slide, um, that sort of give you a background of where we are coming from and thinking about this. And we propose to look at three specific aims or three sort of key questions um, across the five years of this study. First of all, sort of what are the impacts of the Affordable Care Act on women's reproductive health care? Um, we looked at some things both pre and post Affordable Care Act, but more importantly, are there differences in reproductive care in states that expanded Medicaid versus those that did not? So we'll talk to you today about some of those findings. We also took a look at what are some of the individual clinic community and other state level, fact, level factors that are associated with women's reproductive health care. So we'll, 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 we'll present some findings in that area as well. And both of those um, two questions, as we'll talk about later, relied on our quantitative data um, from that, that we have in our research data warehouse. Um, we, we wanted to add, um, in addition to these quantitative explorations, is, is a qualitative aim where we went in and started and talked to people about, talked to patients and providers and staff in community health centers in the OCHA network. And we really wanted to understand how do they perceive policy as impacting the way that reproductive care is delivered in their communities? And, and what are the other factors that they feel are at play? So we can go into the next slide. Um, just as far as our setting, I've mentioned now a couple times that this was uh, conducted as an advanced study, which means that it's not only our OCHIN clinics, but we also have clinics that we partner with in, in Health Choice Network and Fenway. You can see on the left of this slide, there's a map that kind of shows where the patient, the patient dis distribution by state. You can see that heavy um, proportion of the patients that we have of those 8.1 million on the West Coast. And, and with Health Choice Network, we also gain more um, sort of over uh, on the, on the, in the Southeast and in Florida. Um, this is represents 32 different states, 194 health systems. And so includes FQHC, CHC and other CHC look like settings and public health departments. Um, so for our quantitative analyses, we, we utilized all of these data. 
Um, and by, by making this not just an OCEAN study, but an advanced study, it gave us a better ability to, to really compare Medicaid expansion and non-expansion states. When you look at just the OCEAN data, we don't have as many states that were in non-expansion states. So th this was a really great project to, to do with an advance. Um, in addition, for the qualitative piece, we, we recruited six clinics who were willing to let us recruit patients and providers from their CHC to talk to us a bit more about some of our questions. So we made a deliberate effort to, to get some, some clinics in expansion and, and in non-expansion states. We had four in Medicaid expansion states, two in non-expansion states. Four of these six clinics provide prenatal care as part of routine services. And we had a mix of rural and urban. You'll see three rural, two urban, one mixed rural, urban, I started to say rural, urban rural populations. And really with the patient interviews, we, we strove to get to women in their reproductive years. Um, and we really focused, we, we tried to with focus in on women who had had a birth in the, in the past two years to really understand sort of their experience with that spectrum of reproductive care. And overall 23 women were interviewed and we interviewed 30 providers, staff and clinical health systems leaders. And Anna's gonna talk a bit more about some of those findings later in the, later in the presentation. So next slide. Um, just to give you a sense, too, of our conceptual framework that was guiding this work, we, um, we relied a lot on an adaptive behavioral health model as our conceptual framework and to structure our quantitative and qualitative analyses. I won't go in depth into this, um, but really some of the, the a key piece of this is that, you know, we, we really wanted to con consider both community and health center characteristics. Um, and by community, we're referring to sort of the demographic and social composition, sort of public health policy support in the community, community. Um, you know, whether they reside in a Medicaid expansion state, whether there's also Title X funding in that setting. Um, we also looked at some health center characteristics, organizational characteristics, workforce staffing, and then, and then, and then things at the patient level, um, other uh, factors such as age, income, education, um, and, and, and things like insurance, social support, child care, comorbidities. Um, and, and all of these were, were geared towards understanding um, our, depend, our dependent variables of reproductive care, delivery and use, preventive, contraceptive, and pregnancy-related care. If you want to read more about that, I think there's two citations here on the bottom. One talks about this framework a bit more. And the second citation is actually our protocol, the protocol paper for this study. And, and we talk through that conceptual framework a bit more if you're interested in, in, in delving into that further. Um, next slide. So here, just to give sort of a, uh, an overview of, of, of how we structured our analyses, um, as I've said a couple of times, AIMS 1 and 2 were really re our quantitative analyses where we relied on, on electronic health record data from advance. For some analyses, we did bring in some community level data to get a sense of some of the social and economic characteristics of the communities where patients live. Um, and our primary outcome measures, we, we, we picked um, a set of outcome measures that cover the spectrum of reproductive care. So you'll see we had, we looked at aspects of prevented care, um, contraceptive care, and pregnancy care. Um, so you can see here that some, some of the ways that we define those, those, those outcome measures. And, um, and, you know, again, we're trying to look at sort of the, the, the spectrum of reproductive care delivered in, in, in community health center settings. Um, and again, in the qualitative analyses, we relied then on we gather data from our members and from the patients who receive care in CHCs. And, and really this, this piece was getting at their experiences of either providing or receiving care, reproductive care in CHC settings, understanding barriers and facilitators and understanding their perceptions. Like, do they even think about Medicaid expansion in terms of impacting what's happening in their clinic? Are there other things that are, that are really impacting the, the provision of care or their ability to access care? So, so that was trying to kind of get beneath some of the data um, to understand and, and, and help give us more insight into these questions. On to the next slide. So we're gonna walk through some of the findings. This is a really fun exercise to do. This has been great because you, you finish a five-year study, you put out all these different papers, and then to sit back and try to think about like, so, so what did we learn here? So this was, I will say this was exciting. This was also challenging because we did a lot over five years. So what, what we're going to do is try to, try, to, to try to give you some of the highlights, and we're going to talk about them by these specific aims or key questions. So first, we'll talk to you a bit, a bit about um, some of the findings around 
where we looked really specifically at, 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 at the impact on um, of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion. The first area that I'm going to talk to you about today, and I, I Brid Bridget Hatch um, and, and Megan Hoops really um, led this work, but I'm here presenting on their behalf today, is we really looked at starting with that first bucket of outcomes like preventive care. So how did Medicaid expansion under the ACA impact preventive care in CHC settings? Um, and if you look at this, this graph, if you look, um, the blue bars represent those states that had Medicaid expansion and the orange bars rep represent those without Medicaid expansion. So you, you see some, there is, there, is, there is movement in different directions or, uh, across these different outcome measures. And I'll just talk to you a bit about sort of overall what we found. So, I mean, overall there was, if you just look pre and post ACA, there, was, there were significant increases across the board in preventive service delivery after the ACA. And this was true for all the measures that we looked at ex except for blood pressure screenings. Um, what was interesting is looking at the differences in expansion and non-expansion states. And if you look here too, you can see where these blue bars are out ahead. Um, HPV and flu vaccination, both of those increased significantly more in expansion states. But interestingly, cervical cancer, chlamydia, HIV screenings, those increase significantly more in non-expansion states. Um, you can read more about this if you wanna look at this, this citation here. We're still not what, quite sure why some of those non-expansion states showed more improvement, but it, it was encouraging to see just sort of across the board significant increases in preventive service delivery um, post ACA. Um, I believe in the next slide, we're gonna talk about some of the impacts on contraceptive care in CHC settings and I'm gonna Pass it over to my colleague and wonderful co-investigator, Blair Darney. Thank you so much, Erica. Again, I'm Blair Darney. I'm a health services researcher at OHSU, and my work focuses on access, utilization, and health outcomes related with reproductive health services. So that's uh, maternity care, prenatal care, obstetric care, postpartum care, abortion, and contraception in the U.S. and Mexico. And it's been just such a pleasure to be able to learn from and work with um, Dr. Cottrell and the entire Every Woman team. So I really appreciated this opportunity. Um, our contraception studies under the umbrella of the Every Woman study um, were funded by AHRQ, as, as Erica presented, and also the Office of Population Affairs, OPA, and Organon. Um, and we focus on access to most and moderately effective contraception and implement metrics which were developed by the Office of Population Affairs and the National Quality Forum, NQF. So you'll see me talking about most and moderately effective contraception throughout the presentation. Most effective includes what's known as long-acting reversible contraception or LARC and includes IUDs and implants. Moderately effective methods include uh, mostly short-acting hormonal methods such as the pill, depo, uh, the patch, and the ring. So in this uh, main finding from our paper around Medicaid expansion under the ACA and uh, access to contraception in CHC settings, I'm going to focus on the right side of this slide, which is receipt of LARC, long-acting reversible contraception. And I want to note that this is initiation. We're not measuring prevalence, population prevalence of using a method. We're talking about um, initiation within CHC settings. Um, LARC access is an important indicator uh, given the high costs of the devices and the need to have a clinic visit to have an IUD or an implant inserted. So it's a nice marker around um, disparities in access to care. We never expect uh, or want a threshold of initiation or use, but we're really interested in tracking use over time by different populations to give us um, indications of where there might be persistent inequities in access. Um, on the left side is the most or moderately effective methods um, together. So on the right, again, the dots, the lines with dots are Medicaid expansion states, which provided more access overall. You can see both the lines on the top are dots. The squares are non-expansion. The orange dots are clinics that participate in the federal Title X program, which is a federal program that uh, supports access to uh, reproductive health care for low-income individuals 
And many of the CHCs in the advanced network also participate in the Title X program. So this allowed us to look at different federal policies and also, you know, the ACA and Medicaid expansion, but also Title X policy together, which was a great opportunity under, under this study. So overall, if we had put all these lines together, we see about a 0.6% increase in LARC initiation due to Medicaid expansion alone. However, for us, um, a really big takeaway from this study was we can see the role that the Title X program plays in states that did not expand Medicaid. So that's the blue squares, the third line down, where you can see it really goes up between 2014 and 2016 more steeply than the other lines. So again, that is Title X clinics that are not Medicaid expansion states. And we're seeing there the, the crucial role that Title X plays in those states that did not expand Medicaid. I also want to highlight that even a small increase in the incidence of LARC, like, right, we might think, well, why didn't it go up a lot more than 0.6% overall, um, has huge population level effects in terms of preventing unintended pregnancy. Um, we also, so here again, one thing we love doing here was we were able to isolate the impact of Medicaid expansion, also highlight how different funding streams, the reproductive health funding landscape is very fragmented in the US. And in this study, we were able to see here how Medicaid expansion and Title X, two large fund stream, funding streams for reproductive health care, work together to provide access to effective contraception to women with low incomes. Next slide, please. In this study, and I'm presenting here on behalf of our co-investigator, Dr. Maria Rodriguez, um, in this analysis, we examine pregnancy episodes. So trying to put together a whole pregnancy care episode within the EHR data and documented changes in insurance. Since many low-income women qualify for Medicaid due to pregnancy, that's how they gain eligibility for Medicaid, and then they subsequently lose that coverage 60 days postpartum. And here we see on the left our Medicaid expansion, and on the right, uh, women residing in non-expansion states. Patients residing in Medicaid expansion states on the left were significantly more likely than their peers in non-expansion states to retain their Medicaid coverage postpartum. That's the pale blue section at the bottom of the, the bar on both columns, the 44% versus the 12%. This highlights the role of Medicaid expansion under the ACA in maintaining continuous insurance coverage after pregnancy with implications for postpartum care access to postpartum contraception, and management of chronic conditions. This analysis is also relevant to setting us up for future work to evaluate new policy initiatives to expand Medicaid postpartum up to one year from 60 days. Next slide, please. Now we'll move to our second key question, uh, where we move from ACA to thinking about individual clinic, community, and state level factors associated with women's reproductive health care. I already showed results talking about Title X as another policy that impacts reproductive health care. And uh, under every woman, we undertook a series of studies that tried to drill down into this a little bit more. Next slide, please. So here we want to look specifically at Title X. Um, and so our study period here is post-ACA, 2016 to 2018. Um, and again, this is a federal program that supports access to reproductive health care for low-income individuals, and many of the advanced participating CHCs are also Title X clinics. Um, and I, a little context for this, we're post-ACA 2016 to 2018, and we're prior to a Trump administration executive order that weakened the Title X program, and which has since been rescinded. But the, one of the purposes of this analysis was to give us a baseline pre those weakening provisions um, of what was happening with Title X, uh, and really on a national level, because much of the prior research around Title X on Title X either came from aggregate data that's reported up to the Office of Population Affairs, so not individual patient data, or came from single states. For example, there's been a lot of Title X research out of California. So we see here overall the blue lines and their 
uncertainty intervals are tidal 10 and the orange are not tidal 10. And on the right, we have moderately effective. On the left here, we have most effective. We switched them from the previous graph. Um, and we see that Title X clinics consistently provide more contraception overall than those who do not participate in the Title X program. Um, and we see that both for most effective methods, so again, LARC, IUDs, and implants, and for moderately effective methods. We also looked in a subsequent analysis specifically at adolescents, because adolescents were targeted under the executive order that weakened Title X. Um, and often face barriers to accessing reproductive health care. And we found that the Title X clinics provide more contraception to younger women overall than non-Title X clinics, and especially access to uh, most effective methods of contraception. And this has uh, national level impacts when we think about our Healthy People 2030 goals, one of which is to reduce unintended pregnancy overall, and especially among adolescents. So we conclude that Title X improved access to most effective and moderately effective contraception in US safety net clinics. And this analysis provided us solid data to advocate that strengthening Title X should continue to be a national health policy priority. And I'll turn it back over to Erica. Thank you, Blair. So I'm going to talk to you about a, a couple of other analyses we, we, we did that that fell into this bucket of looking at some of the other other factors besides by besides the ACA and Medicaid expansion that in product, uh, that impact the provision of reproductive care. And one of the things we did, too, is to just even take a step back and think about, you know, this is not research that had been done much if at all, in, 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 in our OCHIN data before is really looking at pregnancy and prenatal care. So we really wanted to take a, take a step back and try to understand the, the scope of this in NCHC settings. Um, uh, Megan Hoops, Fran Beal, and Katie Putnam did some really great work, and I'm really you know crediting all, all of the analysts at OCHIN for their leadership and really digging into these data and thinking about how do we capture sort of pregnancy? How do we capture pregnancy episodes? This is, again, this is like we had to do some formative things here and just thinking about how to characterize these variables that, that hadn't been done before. So there was just so much groundwork that our OCHIN analyst team team did to make this happen. So one thing that I think that, that, that we found overall is that really looking throughout our data, we saw that 41% of health centers across advance do provide longitudinal prenatal care. Um, the, it really sort of showed that community-based primary care health centers are important partners in, in thinking about how we address inequities in maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, the patient populations that these clinics serves are, you know, disproportionately more people of color, people with low income, people with multiple chronic conditions. And so I think um, the beauty of this paper that you all can look at is it just sort of set, again, set the landscape. We talk about the pregnancy landscape paper. So how is pregnancy care done in, in CHC settings? And I really, what I think this one does as well is sets the stage for future research that, that could be done within OCHIN to think about how do we address inequities in maternal morbidity, morbidity and mortality in, um, in this country. Uh, and the next one, another thing that we looked at um, across all outcomes, and I'm going to talk most specifically of, of one, the contraceptive utilization outcome here is we wanted to understand sort of apart from policy changes and all of that, how do social determinants of health affect contraceptive utilization in CHC settings? And we also really wanted to look at, we in, in this analysis that I'm presenting here, we try to distinguish between individual level social determinants of health, things like race, ethnicity, um, the primary payer, do you have public insurance? Do you have private insurance? Are you uninsured? And um, we looked at income FPL. Um, and then we also looked at some community level social determinants of health. So, so characteristics of the neighborhood that you are living in. And we wanted to understand, is there, is there a different impact of these two types of social determinants? Often they're lumped together and we really wanted to kind of tease those out a bit. Um, I'm presenting here some results from, as I said, the contraceptive utilization um, analyses, but we did this across all outcomes and found remarkably similar results. So as you'll see here, the, the, the dots that are orange, um, and, and, and here we, I should say again too, we looked at tier one and tier two most and moderately effective contraception as, as, as Blair described earlier. 
Um, we we did see some, you know, there there was some movement around, you know, with some of these individual level um, social determinants, uh, sort of, you know, those who were uninsured may be less likely to to receive tier two, um, those with higher income sort of more likely to have to have either of those. Um, what was really interesting, though, is how the community level social determinants, there was there was really no movement. And we cut this sort of every which way trying we tried different here we talk about social deprivation index, which is a national percentile ranking at the census tract level. No impact on sort of contraceptive utilization in CHC settings. We also looked at this for some of the preventive measures. We looked at this for also some of the prenatal and postpartum measures. And, and remarkably, um, across all of these, these measures, sort of the, those community level variables didn't budge and there wasn't an impact. And so part of this may be that um, some of the constraints of these variables, we, we generally serve populations that are lower income and there may just not be enough variation there to pick this up. Another more optimistic um, way of looking at this is to think that you know community health centers are, are doing a really good job providing care to, to, to people regardless of where they live. This is part of their mission. This is why they were created. So, so we'll, we'll continue looking into this, but, but, it, but it was striking to us that no matter how we cut it, no matter what outcome we used, it, it really wasn't having a big, a big effect. And, and just one last thing that I'll add on these findings to put it into context is we have found this in other studies we've done with other outcome measures as well. We found this say with um, HbA1c, um, you know, having the testing done, so a sort of screening for diet, like screening measures being done, that there was no impact. What was interesting though is then we would find there was a difference when looking at whether their diabetes was poorly controlled or not. So even, even, even though CHCs may be providing very good equitable care across the board, it, it sometimes could be that, that folks, um, depending on their social determinants, may have worse outcomes. And so in this, in this study, we were looking at lots of the care provision. And so I think the basic take home message here is that CHCs are, from the data we have, doing a really good job at providing that care equitably across uh, from folks across different settings. And let's go on to the next slide. So now um, we are going to let you know a bit about some of the qualitative work we did in this study. Um, it was a true joy to, to be able to do a mixed method study in this area. Um, everything we've talked about thus far comes from our quantitative data. And as I mentioned before, we recruited six clinics um, to, to help us with this qualitative data collection and recruited you know, both providers and patients from these clinics and conducted um, in-depth interviews with those folks to really understand their experiences with reproductive care and, and their perceptions of policy changes. And I'm gonna hand it over now to Anna to talk with you um, about some of these findings. Thanks, Erica. Um, so we'll dive right in here. Um, among the 23 patients that we spoke with, they consistently expected that primary care would include reproductive care. And people were generally really satisfied with the care that they were receiving and the options that they had, but they were also unfamiliar with the full range of services in their health centers, such as STI testing or long-acting reversible contraception. And Beyond their reproductive health needs, many women had really complex medical and social situations that they both wanted and expected their care teams to acknowledge. Uh, some examples include chronic conditions, um, especially around previous pregnancy losses, trauma, and family structure. And women also identified their health centers as important sources, not only of care, but also making connections with other people and especially other parents and connecting with services in their communities. And there was a, just a, a lovely <laughs> description among a lot of the people that we talked to of them encouraging their friends or their family to get care at the health center. They were getting their own care for this exact reason. And overall patients attributed their access to care more to the health centers themselves than to the broader community or policy context like Medicaid expansion. And also, um, many of the barriers that women commonly mentioned, like transportation or time off and childcare, weren't really being discussed as policy related so much as um, community or individual issues. And I'm going to successfully advance the slide here. There we go. 
Um, so we also spoke to 30 health center clinician staff and leaders to understand practice perceptions. And much like patients, this group attributed community and social factors like geography or population characteristics and also health services, um, especially things like the availability of local re referral services like Planned Parenthood as having the greatest impacts on care. They also emphasize patient characteristics, including health literacy, family structure, language, and migrant status as influencing both care use and access. Uh, Medicaid expansion was commonly credited with improving cervical cancer screening and contraceptive care, and especially uh, related to the availability and provision of long-acting reversible contraception. As far as other policy impacts on care, this group really cited uh, uncertain policy and practice environments, especially over the last several years with reproductive health and immigration policy changes and also the COVID pandemic itself. And uh, like patients, uh, uh, health center staff and uh, clinicians really strongly identified health centers themselves as critical for connecting people to reproductive care. And this included um, sort of maybe more specific CHC or FQHC functions like having sliding scale fees, insurance navigation support, and also integrated services um, such as mental and behavioral health and school-based health care. And the overall, we really found that with both, both of the groups of folks that we were talking to, they were attributing community health system and individual factors as having more influence on care, but that these tended to roll up pretty clearly to a mix of federal and state level policies. So first, although most people found pregnancy related care stayed pretty constant, with Medicaid expansion, preventive and contraceptive care access improved noticeably, but there are still gaps in eligibility and coverage. So lots of folks don't have reliable access to a fuller range of, of reproductive care, um, and especially reproductive care that's inclusive of all sexual orientations and gender identities, specialty care, fertility care, and even to some extent sterilization and LARCs. Um, second, the CHC system and designation through uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration really helps to provide a vital point of access for routine reproductive care. But as I just discussed, the health center program's resources are limited. They're really susceptible to the impact of other policy changes. And this means that CHCs are having to operate and grow and meet the needs of their individual communities in that persistent environment of scarcity and uncertainty that they described. And then third, at the state level, policies just vary really widely in their presence and implementation. And um, although Medicaid coverage became more consistent across expansion states after the ACA, the folks thought variations in how care was organized and integrated with routine, the reproductive care was organized and integrated with routine care were really pronounced. Um, similar differences, as Blair has uh, mentioned, were really noted in relation to the Title X program and its administration being so different from state to state. And, um, and then also brought up some other really interesting ones that we can look at later, but I couldn't look at in much depth with this um, study related to um, vaccine requirements as being real facilitators to reproductive health care, and also scope of practice regulations and how those are implemented state to state. And I will hand it back to Erica. Thank you, Anna, for that lovely um, description of, of the qualitative findings. So we, I'm going to try to give you a sense of sort of overall some of the key findings after listening to that whirlwind um, um, presentation and journey through our five years. Um, so first, you know, across the, the analysis that we conducted, we, we really found that Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act was, it was really, it was increases in, associated, as you saw, with increases in a preventive care receipt, contraceptive utilization and insurance coverage. So, so re really um, seeing that, that positive impact of Medicaid expansion. Um, we did also note some other individual clinic community and policy factors that impact provision of reproductive health care and community health care settings. Um, Title X especially um, has a big impact on, on, on 
on, 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 on reproductive health care in these settings. And, and I think sort of most importantly across all these studies is just is just echoing and sort of driving home the really important and central role that community health centers play in providing equitable reproductive health care for women, including adolescents, people of color, those with low income, and people with mul multiple chronic conditions. I think that um, this study, as I see it, is the beginning, not the end. Um, I think this was the first study of many that will continue to look into these issues and, and, and it sort of laid the groundwork in many ways for a, a future body of research that, that I know all of us on this team are, are committed to. Um, and with that, I wanted to just highlight a few of the key areas for future research and next steps. Although there may, okay, yeah, that's good. Okay, I, I didn't know if I messed up the order. So some of the things that we've noted in the, in the context of, of the studies that we have done and the analyses as we've done is, is really the need for a deeper, deeper exploration of patient experiences, sort of more qualitative work around reproductive health experiences, experiences of pregnancy in the postpartum period, um, really thinking about and diving into some of the barriers that people face in, in accessing care and using some of those patient experiences and explorations as a way to sort of fully under, unpack some of the disparities that we continue to see. Um, you know, lived experience is often left out of our research and, and, and we wanna to continue to make it central. Um, Additionally, a you know, further exploration of some community and clinic characteristics associated with reproductive care provision. Um, some additional uh, exploration of you know, methods and data for linking to capture outcomes that occur outside of primary care. So I think um, there's been a lot of recent calls for really looking at how do we move the needle on disparities in maternal mortality? And, and I think Ochin is well positioned to do some research there, but, but in order to do that, we, we would really need to link to other data um, on pregnancy care, birth care and outcomes, um, you know, data, data from hospitals and vital, vital records. Um, as Blair articulated uh, when she was talking about um, looking at insurance coverage after pregnancy, there are other opportunities to look at changes in the policy environment. And specifically right now, I think there, there's an opportunity to look at expanded postpartum Medicaid eligibility, which, which some states are um, extending to 12 months post postpartum. So a really good opportunity to, to, to look at that in our data. Um, and also a, a, a study that's under review right now led by Dr. Darney, um, and, and, and I also collaborated on is, is really looking at immigration policies and sort of how those spill over to impact reproductive care utilization for both immigrant and non-immigrant populations. Um, and, and lastly, like I think as we've said throughout, really more clearly understanding and being able to demonstrate the role that health centers play in, in sort of mitigating um, inequities in maternal care access utilization and outcomes. So we'll continue to look for opportunities to, to, to do more of that work um, and, and, and drive that work forward. And if others of you on the call have ideas, have thoughts, especially those of you who are our members and are delivering care in these settings and are thinking, man, there's something interesting going on here right now, we'd really like to study it. Please, please, please reach out. Like our research team, this is why we do this. We want to do research that matters, and that's important. So um, we would love to hear from you if you feel like there are some some burning questions that you have, or things that are happening in the field that you think would make sense for um, further study. So the last thing I wanted to say is that um, our, I think, what do you say, communications team, like our team at Ochin did a really wonderful job at helping us think about how best to disseminate some of our findings. I, uh, traditionally in research, we disseminate by publishing in a peer reviewed journal and you saw, um, for, or presenting at conferences and you saw throughout our slides, like we included at the bottom, those places that we did that, but we wanted to think about how, how can we get this out more broadly? Um, and so our communications team helped us to put together a website and, and you can, you can Go there if you'd like to see more of, of what we found over these five years. It is beautiful. Thank you so much to everyone who contributed to this. And I also wanted to give just a, a big, big shout out and thank you to Anna Templeton, who you just heard from, who really spearheaded these efforts to think about like, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we disseminate this? How do we think about how to get our findings out? And this is one of the most comprehensive and beautiful dissemination efforts 
that I've seen from a research study. So thank you, Anna, for all of that work in leading in leading this dissemination effort. Um, so please go visit that. It's advancedcollaborative.org slash everywoman, and, and you can explore that for yourselves. So with that, I think we are done. I can't believe we only went two minutes over. Um, well, <clears throat> thank you, Drs. Cottrell, Templeton, and Darney for that fantastic presentation to start off 2023. And thank you to everyone who attended today's session. Be sure to follow Ocean on Twitter at, at Ocean Inc. and over on LinkedIn. In addition, head over to ocean.org and advancedcollaborative.org to read the latest on our research studies, blog posts, and upcoming events. And be sure to check out advancedcollaborative.org slash everywoman to learn all about the Everywoman study. And don't forget to visit our Ocean YouTube channel to catch up on those past Grand Rounds presentations. And stay tuned for next month's Ocean Grand Rounds, where on February 16th from 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific time, we welcome Dr. Shannon Sweeney of Oregon Health and Science University and Ann Romer of Ocean as they present on effective facilitator strategies for supporting primary care practice change. Invitations to this presentation will be sent two weeks prior to the event, but if you're not on our mailing list and are interested in attending this or any future event, please email me at grandrounds at ocean.org. That's grand rounds, all one word, grand rounds at ocean.org. So from all of us at Ocean and Drs. Cottrell, Templeton, and Darney, to all of you, have a wonderful rest of your day and stay healthy out there. <laughs>